Uh, so so it's uh, actually yeah. that story that you were talking about with Ron Howard. The, the are we on? Oh, we're on it. We were already shooting. We, we've been. Yeah, yeah. Been no, always. I just wanted to actually make a few comments before we even start. Yeah, so right. the, 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 that story would go ahead. Read one, Howard. Yeah. Um, I remember the story vaguely, but I actually didn't know that it was so big that somebody would make a movie about it. Why was? Why would that? Why did that event was so? Why did it stand out so much? So I guess you know I haven't seen it yet. I yeah. am supposed to see it, to watch it tonight, but. If I can make an assumption, it's because the outstanding, incredibly beautiful documentary okay. that they did about it, it was aired last year and was even nominated for the Academy Award. Oh, wow. But never made it to the top. It is a documentary made by a British and Australian producers that were covering the story from the very beginning. Because those 13 kids, plus their teacher, were stuck in that cave in Thailand for a couple of months until they could rescue them. And uh, How did they, they survive to, without yeah, food? No. Because they, they supplied them with food. Oh, so With yeah. divers. Wow. Throughout the whole time until the water came, came down for a while on spring or summertime. And that was the time they could basically... Through diving and after teaching them and training them how to dive, they managed to go through the floods and through the water underneath and get them out of the cave. That is a crazy story. It I would, is I a crazy love, story. I would actually the, love to watch that. All film. of them, the whole routine, kids plus their teacher. Wow. Uh, bringing experts and you know all those people from all over the world, this French guy, the Australian guy, um, Rescue experts from basically from all over the world. Wow! I think even one from Israel. Incredible. Because uh, unfortunately, we have our experience too. Well, uh, so Igor, we can officially start. Go ahead, uh, Daniel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So first of all, I want to say that uh, I'm very honored, and I I really thank you for taking the time to come and do the show. Uh, it's uh, I've been calling you a friend for now the last year or so, maybe a little longer, but it's still a little surreal because, uh, well. Uh, American audience will probably know maybe a little less, but in Israel, you kind of have a, a known personality. Your voice is a kind of household thing in Israel. It's a very known voice. You've been a part of the um, reporting force of Israel for a very long time. Started all the way from the Galei Tzal in the army, and then you uh, basically were on any, uh, really, most Israeli channels, right? It was, it was basically... I wonder if your audience knows what Galei Tzal is to begin with. Gale, well, we'll talk about well, that, but, been, but it's... But it's, it, but it's it, been a while, it's been a while. Yeah, you know. so basically, you, Galei Tzal is basically the Israeli... Uh, IDF arm, military IDF's radio. IDF's military radio station. Yeah, and that, the armed forces radio is basically targeting, you know, younger audiences, not necessarily just soldiers, and that's where I started my career as a DJ. <laughs> I was you, presenting the international top 40 from Radio Israel, GLZ. Hey, yeah. hey everybody. <laughs> it's really funny because they, they target, they actually go for music mostly. You would yeah. think that the, that station would be more focused on like, you know, uh, kind of like current events and uh, uh, covering. Actually, you know, there stories. are two of them. There's Galatz and Galgalatz. Oh, Gal Galat is the music, the most popular radio music, radio station, pop radio station in Israel. It's been like that for over three decades or so and that's the that's something that started after I left because it's been long since I've been there and there is the other one the original Galei Tzahal which is a talk show basically news uh, uh, current affairs anything you can might probably military affairs national defense issues everything you can possibly think of so yeah I mean so again I, I kind of grew up on you know hearing your voice on the news and, and now I get to interview you so it's, it's, a, it's a great honor well the honor is mine Danny thanks for having me it's, it's, it's I think it is yeah. a great compliment um, um, I, we've well, known each other for quite some time for, now. well yeah for quite a few years and, and uh, professionally and socially professionally and socially yes and yeah and it's it's being here it's, it's, absol it's absolutely a pleasure to have you over I, um, let's start with something pretty easy uh, one of the, I think you told me this a few times, but I want to take it kind of like chronologically. You started um, in what we just mentioned in uh, in Galatz. Uh, Actually, earlier. Oh, earlier. Yeah, I was. Can we use Israeli Hebrew terms, words every here and there, just to make my point? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 
And we can explain those, of course. those terms as well. Yeah, yeah. I was, from a very early age, so here's the thing. When I meet young kids or people, people in the 20s, even in the 30s, they're not sure what they want to do with their lives. I'm like, what's going on? I, from the moment I turned my first radio on, the radio cassette that I got for, I, that I got for my bar mitzvah, we're talking 13, right? I knew that that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. That's crazy. Being on broadcasting, doing everything connected or tied to broadcasting. This is my first radio cassette from my bar mitzvah. So I began by then, by 13, 14, I became what they call in Israel, Katav Noar. Can you explain that to your audience? Yeah, it's basically a, a reporter, youth a youth reporter. reporter. Youth yeah. reporter. So somebody who's a teenager, I would assume that there's probably a bunch of shows like that in Nickelodeon, probably in Disney. I'm not really, I'm it's not really familiar. It, it's a teen show. We used to have a radio show at, the, at those years called Radio Isle. <laughs> teen radio. That's how we, that's wow. it. Wow. Yeah, Radio Isle. But how did you get into that? Like you so, just. Uh, I was listening all to all those shows, and one you know one day they said that they're looking for kids in high school, or uh, or kids period, for different shows to be part of, and I was like, right, take me. I kept calling, and at the time we had those telephones that we used yeah, to the dial, rotary like, like literally dial. Yeah, well, I and still had your them finger too. got red, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I kept dialing. I kept dialing day and night until I got them. Wow, and, and, that's determination. And next thing so you I really found knew. myself there, yeah. I, this is uh, something that, I mean, it's not crazy to me because I was one of those individuals who, even though there were things that I got very interested in very much early on, but then I made some different decisions and I went in different directions. So people can get, like, as I'm an example of that, can kind of get uh, maybe a little lost in what is the thing. But I think... I don't know if it's necessarily available to everybody, but I would like to believe that it's available to everybody. Like when I have kids, I would like to imagine that I would be able to see what their predispensations are and then allow them to kind of unfold into that direction. Maybe encourage a little bit, never push, but like notice that. Because I think a lot of times kids, like you're saying, you had this drive, you saw it and then you just knew. But I think a lot of kids, even if they know, there's a lot of other temptations kind of around. And I think, this you don't think so? This is so important what you're saying right yeah. now. I'll tell you why. It is very important, and needless to say, that if you have kids and, you, and they have some talents and there's something their soul goes for, you as a parent, you know, that you might be sometimes. So maybe I will, I will maybe hopefully I will. be soon, yeah. Maybe oh, rum rumors okay. have it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you are supposed to to support your kid, to help him develop his natural talents and explore what he's, you know, what he's up to, basically. However, being an Israeli Jewish kid in the 60s and later 70s, in being a teenager, thinking of a career in broadcasting and journalism period, was something that my parents didn't appreciate very much, to say the least. That had to do with something with, you speak lots of languages. I need to say, I need to tell your audience, this guy <laughs> is amazing. He speaks Hebrew, English, Russian, and who knows what more, what else, as native, you know, as he was born in all those different <laughs> countries. You know, People this are going to think I paid is, you to do this. This is what you... <laughs> Well, yeah. wait, wait, wait a second. But you did. But, no, okay, no, but that no, is true. We yeah. said we're not going to talk yeah. about. Uh, no, wait a second. So but but uh, my not parents to... thought that should to finish it. Sure, sure. This is Luftgeschäft. Luftgeschäft. It's in Yiddish. It means air business. Air business means something floating, something flaky, something that doesn't really actually exist, something that has no future in it for you or for anyone surrounding you. So you better stop it and start thinking of a serious career. It's Which, pretty common. But parents get afraid when their kids want to be an artist or a performer because it seems like it's so flimsy. You know, like when I was presented the news on the Israeli radio for the first time, a neighbor asked my mo told my mother, "Listen, I heard your son the other day in the news. He's he's really good. At, but what does he do for a living?" <laughs> <laughs> Serious. <laughs> I, I I really appreciate all your uh, you know. Uh, 
all the ble- all the praises you uh, you bless me with, but like I mean, speaking three languages is not really something that I've achieved. It's because I was born in Russia, I three grew up that, in Israel. Three that I'm aware of. Yes, maybe not more. But, but actually, yeah. on your Wikipedia page, it says like, that you speak all, you speak like what five or six? Listen, no, 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 not at all. No, we all, we we both live in Los Angeles. Right. With your talent of languages, okay. This can be a two-way conversation, right? Can I ask you also questions? You know, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are these the only three languages that you speak? Yes. I would assume, knowing you and knowing the way, how fluent and how articulate you are in all those three languages, that you might know some Spanish, at least. Tiny bit. Like, not, not, not enough to say I speak the language. Just because My, we live here. Kelsey does. Actually. She does. Yeah. No, I mean, honestly, I, I try to learn. Uh, and it's something that unless I feel like if you're not immersed in the in the culture and in the language, I always say that you only speak the language when you speak the mannerisms of the language. So I think one of the reasons that I um, got pretty good at speaking Hebrew pretty fast when I got to Israel and I actually it took me a, a little bit longer to speak like American, American English because there's certain, you know, um, again, mannerisms in the language that are different than, let's say, speaking, Brit- speaking British or something. But I think that I like the I like the little ceremonial moves that people do when they speak a different language. I like the body gestures, the stuff like that. So I'm very drawn towards the choice the- of words. The choice the of words, yeah, but that, but that's because I was reading the, quite a bit. Yeah, it's the basic mistake that everybody is doing, I mean, which is we, we we are translating basically. Yeah, like translating in a different language. Yeah, for different languages from our for our original, my original language will always be Hebrew. You know, so, Interesting. You know, it's you know making all those comedians, making jokes of all those Israelis coming to America and making you know I don't want to. I don't want to say I don't want to tell nasty jokes now, but oh please, uh, yeah, I, I, feel I, free. I don't know. So like I was, you know, this guy that kept fucking on the door until somebody opened, you know, because knocking and fucking it's the same word in Hebrew. Oh, it's so interesting. Yeah, lit folk, Yeah. Wait, so. but but so this is something. I mean, first of all, I, I really I, I really appreciate the the uh, the kind words because uh, again, someone who does what you do on the level that you do, uh, when you compliment my ability to communicate in general, it's like, it's a big compliment. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think it's mostly derived from my interest in the, in the language as a whole, not just the spoken language, but the language as it's expressed through the mannerisms that people exert when they actually speak. And I think that's the thing that makes it maybe stand out a little bit more, but unfortunately, no, I speak only three languages. I'm trying to do Japanese right now. Three. That's it. But I, I, English, Russian, in Hebrew. In Hebrew. But I'm trying to do Japanese, which is very, very hard. And uh, it's probably going to take me quite a few years. And Spanish, I think I can get a, get a hang on. But unless I live in the place or speak to people who this speak the so language. This is so true. I have the experience yeah. to practice. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, um, my family, who's from Germany, and the German Jews had a hard time learning Hebrew. So they kept speaking German at home. And my grandma... She spoke only German. Those yekes, the way we call them in Israel, they never actually got the Hebrew. I mean, this is, this was very, very difficult. She like was a Holocaust the, survivor? No. She, no, my, the Germans somehow ran away from Germany before the war. My mother's side is Hungarian. They are Holocaust survivors full time. So they also know Yiddish? Yes. Okay. But I grew up with German, and I was talking to my my parents were talking German, and my family and everybody, aunts, uncles, everybody, and grandma. So I grew up a lot with my grandma, and she spoke only German, so I had basically no choice until it got to the point where at a certain age, at Kita Ali, first grade or second grade, I spoke Hebrew with slight German accent in really? Israel. And we're talking... I'm 65 now, so we're talking like almost 60 years ago. Wow. And at those years, they used to call me Nazi. Wow. An Israeli Jew, born and raised in Israel, but having that slight German accent was bad enough for kids, you know, to come. And, and I was. That's crazy. That was like a trauma that I was carrying for many years. So wow. I got home, I told my parents, listen, I'm not going to do school anymore. So they took me to that speech therapist where all the broadcasters used to come to and actors and all the, you know, the, all the entertainment industry used to go to that best speech therapist in Tel Aviv at the time, Pauline Zati, I even remember her name. And uh, 
that's how I got my obsession to broadcasting. Interesting, because and, you you had to engage the total, with the language from the perfect total command of the Hebrew language. Wow. With no exceptions whatsoever. Yeah. Which I'd like to think I got eventually. No, you definitely got. Yeah. I hope so. I hope yeah. so. Listen, being a news announcer on the national public radio of Israel comes with different commitments and obligations. You are not supposed to make any mistakes in Hebrew whatsoever. Yeah, because you're supposed to have the most... And once, you, you are the representative of what, of the how we carry crazy. the language. We had to pass these, these grammar exams where the only passing uh, number was 100. Now, if you got, if you had a mistake, you had to, re- to go back and do this, you know, wow. the exam again until you had no mistakes at all. Was it in just in spoken language or in written language as well? Spoken. Every, spoken language. Yeah. That's so interesting. Because we are broadcasting. Yeah, I didn't know. Yeah. I w- do you think that... Yeah, yeah. But this, does this exist you today? If you write your own text, you suppose, you know, of course, if this is, if you make grammar... Uh, mistakes or changing different words or using false words or making all, uh, different mistakes they're correcting you they're still correcting you and you, st- you still need to go back but you're supposed to write speak and the right pronunciation and by saying and by pronunciation that means names names from the bible that nobody actually knows how to write how to actually pronounce names from the news any news Arab names, we keep saying them in the news. We keep mentioning those names all the time. You know, because if you're making those mistakes, you're making. And I was, I, I was, I was teaching journalism and broadcasting for many years in Israel, and I was telling my students, listen, this is a mistake that not you are doing. We all are doing. You know why? Because when you're changing somebody's name, it's not that you heard that name being pronounced that way. You made it up, and this is a minute, the credibility of you as an announcer, as a broadcaster, and it's not just you, because the listener that knows, listeners who know the right way to pronounce those names say, who are those idiots that let that guy be in the news? So how do you compare it to what's going on in the media today? Where people are expressing their opinions and, and feelings. Like, by the way, th- th- does this, th- let me ask you this. Does this, you feel like this happens in Israel as much as it happens here or not so much? You know what it's, I'm talking about? Like when, when CNN reporters basically express an emotion about the subject or. You're talking about two different things. No, no, but it also, but it also encompasses their credibility. So you were talking about credibility, and I understand what you're saying. You're saying that if you just made up a name instead of saying, I'm not sure how to say the name, yeah. that hurts your no, credibility. No, you need to check ahead of time. Yeah, you're exactly. That hurts your credibility. Checking. And I, I'm your editor. Okay. Right. I'm your producer. Don't be shy. If you see a name, somebody's name that you've never seen before, and you're not sure how to say it right, ask Ask me, ask anybody in the newsroom, instead of going in the news, you know, and, 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 and being, being that guy that thinks he knows everything and then make us all stupid, look, sound stupid. So again, so that's, so that's my question. Do You're you talking, feel... Yeah, go ahead. So, no, no. So what I'm saying is that in Israel now, I don't watch the Israeli media, uh, but you're still connected to it you still work for right now you're working for as a reporter for 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 Khan, the, 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 israeli, the israeli broadcast broadcast the israeli public broadcast so it's wh- something similar to pbs and npr i see so basically so it's more like educational so do you feel that the mainstream media in israel uh still has this credibility you're talking about or do you feel that it's less and then do you feel that the American media has a lot, a lot more tilt now because they are trying to sell clicks? They're trying to sell basically, you know, sensationalism. Basically, it's a great question. Media, news broadcasting, talking of anything, both in the Israeli and American and worldwide media, has credibility problem today. Nowadays, it has nothing to do with the right expression, with the right pronunciation of different names. If there is there is a war in Ukraine right now, right, you probably be more familiar than I am in those how to pronounce right those names, right. So is it Kherson or Kherson or Kherson or oh the hell knows how to pronounce it, or in a, you know in CNN I hear the capital of Ukraine is, I actually don't know Kiev or Kiev. Kiev. Oh Kiev is the capital. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So who knows? And um, this is one thing. So you need to be, you're not supposed to make all those mistakes by pronouncing different names or places or events or or details. You know, Andy Warhol said, God is in those little details. But that's my point to you, that I guess the way that I'm seeing it, and tell me what you think about that. You're talking about expressing different opinions. So so let me, so let me... That's her credibility. But let me make a bridge in your mind, the way that I see the connection there. So... The way that I see it, it's, it starts from, like you said, in the details, it starts from the attitude you carry into your job. So if you are doing, um, if you have this general habit or rule in the station or, you know, wherever you work, that you're putting so much emphasis on, on even the right pronunciation, I feel like that attitude must carry itself, carry itself into things like, Never say something even that is gen- you think is generally true. Say things that you're sure about. And if you're not sure about, you have to express the fact that you're not sure about it. And I feel like that attitude, it comes from the same place. So even though this is just about pronunciation and this is about like voicing something that might not even be true as true, and it seems like completely two different things, I feel that the attitude that leads to being flimsy here is the same attitude that makes you flimsy here like you you, you listen to screws basically so, so that, that's so the connection that i'm seeing there thank you for making those remarks because accuracy and being accurate about what you're talking about this is a different story this is something so crucial and so important because all you need to have reliable sources you can't make it up and it depends whom you rely on so here's the thing. We have this January 6th commission. This is the biggest story in the States now for the past couple of months now. So the biggest political story other than, you know, the pandemic or everything or, or, the, or, the, or, the, or the economy, the recession. So what do you make of it? If you're a Democrat, you think that Trump was the biggest disaster ever. If you're a Republican, you think that this is a... The Biden an is attempt, the biggest. An attempt. No, Biden. <laughs> nobody thinks Biden is the bigger. Republicans believe that this is a political attempt to change the results of a democratic uh, choice. And election because Trump still has lots of supporters. Was he to blame in January 6th, you know, Congress story or not? Was he, was he responsible for that? Depends who you're asking. It's a question of political approach, opinion, attitude. Depends who you're coming from. Depends what you choose, basically, to believe in. Hmm. And that leads us to something that Trump himself invented. Or, which, or, is? Or, which is fake news. Do you think we Trump are, invented are, it? Yes, he, he was the first one to use this term. Really? Yeah. yeah. He was the first one... Right in the first year of his service in the White House, he used to scream and shout, and the reporters who uh, who didn't, uh, who, 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 who reporters who asked all those different questions they didn't like. You have fake news, CNN mostly. He was like personal. He had this thing against CNN, and maybe New York Times and all the liberal media, the Washington Post. The LA Times, maybe, and, and of course the three big networks, not to mention MSNBC. So the majority of the, the, the media. Ma- the, what, what he calls the liberal media. Which is the majority of the media. I mean, what do you have, Fox I News mean, on the right? That's it. So now Pretty you much. are being biased. I mean, this is... No, 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 wait a second. You don't so think that's true? People, you don't so feel like many, there's an actual lean I'm there? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. You are sure. I'm not. I'm not sure. Oh no, I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm just saying. You just called it the liberal media. Yeah. So I'm saying that that's the, the, the ma- everything you mentioned just now the is majority, the majority of the media. The majority that you and me watch. Uh, well, but the, can you name any other ones that are yes, not leading? Yes. Yeah, okay. You just mentioned Fox News. But that's it. The uh, Washington Reporter. There are all kinds of right wing. Uh, uh, all those radio hosts. You know, the guy who just died recently. What's his name? Um, uh, forgot his name. You know, Who just died? Uh, one of the, the like guy, podcasters uh, or something? Yeah, radio host. The, radio the, host. The, he was, he was, he was very, very extreme right wing. Interesting. Yeah. 
Let me get it. Glenn Beck? No. no. Glenn Beck is a lot. Glenn Beck is also very, very yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hard, you know, hardcore right wing. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, but we're talking about, like, uh, news outlets, right? He was, he, he died of this illness a couple of months ago. There are more people listening to all those right wing uh, 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 columnists and the radio hosts. So you, were talking hosts. About, you were talking about Rush Limbaugh, right? And the guy you have all those channels, if you just keep zapping on your smart TV, you're going to find all those channels that we and me probably are not aware of, but everybody is watching them. Hmm. Right wing, conservative, um, semi religious channels. Rush Limbaugh, just to mention it, Glenn Beck, you just mentioned him. Yeah. Um, there is this girl that I used to like very much. This woman, she's she's been doing a great job ever since, and she is uh, she is now Megan the, Kelly. Megan Kelly. Yeah, I can I think wonderful. Megan Kelly is amazing. She is amazing. Yeah. Well, she's very beautiful and she's very articulate. Yeah, but she's also very she she, she holds people's feet to the point. exactly. Yes. Yeah. But also, I feel like she's maybe when she was in the Fox News, she had to be to some extent, uh, you know, biased because that they do have this bias kind of leaning towards right I don't think it's a secret uh, but y- you can see that even when she was there she was still way more balanced than a lot of people in the network and now well, uh, yeah the bottom line is and besides um, the, I think the uh, the best I mean the um, the guy with the, the best rating in the United States nowadays is that guy from Fox News Carlson Tucker Oh really? Yeah. Oh, but he's by himself, right? He's not. He's not. Yeah, on he's Fox by News. himself, and yeah. there are all, all those other Laura. Isn't it Joe Laura Rogan? Laura Ingram. Who? What would you say? Joe Rogan. Isn't he the number? Joe one? Rogan. Joe Rogan is a radio host. A podcast host. Yeah. 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 Oh, so I mean, he's not on TV. I well, mean, no, it's visual yeah. though. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's visual. Yeah, but I think I think Carson Tucker is the uh, he's got the most rating nowadays. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So as far as like in the news world. The people who are trying to yeah. bring Ro- uh, uh, Joe Rogan is big on Spotify. Well, because Not he moves to Spotify. Live show. Yeah, right, 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 right. Because otherwise, it would be on YouTube. Yeah. No, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is that is is your point that the media is more balanced than people tend to think because there's a lot of channels that you and I as liberals are not aware of. Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. Okay, so you're saying that there's a big market and it's very very actually big and that I, I guess the data that supports your claim is that yes. trump was elected yes so that means there's enough people to actually support him being and, elected and many many people many of his supporters of his 70 something million people who did actually vote for the second time who still believe that he won the second time around also hmm. although nobody could possibly prove it and right. that's the whole idea behind those excursions, the, 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 the January, the January six issue. So, so what do you, what do you what do you use your obviously you, you know you try to keep your credibility. So you're probably not going to want to make any like bold predictions. But your impression is that uh, I'm sure he's going to try and run again. Do you think he has a chance to be elected again? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's and a- and here's the thing. It's a choice between the bad and the worse probably yeah. there is it's a very very interesting point in time we are in the mid of 2022 we have midterm elections coming up by november and right after that we gonna see by the way on my way here i just got the word that uh, jo- uh the joe biden got the COVID again for the second time in a couple of weeks it's, it's, Wait, what? it's something he was he tests again positive for COVID. Huh. Well, I personally think we you might. Know, I don't know if we're going to disagree old, on this. But this is an old guy. That's what I'm saying. Has different. He, he has a problem. You know, this yeah. guy. It's difficult. It's not very pleasant watching him right now. No, I, th- I think he's done. I think I think I think his age. Whether we agree or not, if he has like an extra condition, dementia, whatever. But I I think that. Even without that, I think he's just too old. I think at this point, it's just his condition. He's you not know, fit he's to be 80, a president he's anymore. He's 79, 80. There are people in his age who are capable of doing everything. But not him. Are. It's probably not him. It's, he, you know, it's, it's sometimes embarrassing to see how insecure he feels now talking in public and everybody around him. You can see the stress on the face of his age's and stuff yeah. when he's going to yeah. 
when he starts talking like like just like that to reporters, making all those mistakes, mumbling, making yeah. all those remarks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so, so wait. So it's him, and it's Trump. It's not the Trump a young kid. He is. He is a person of age also. How much? How old is he? Seventy-seven. He 76, should be approaching eighty. Seventy-six. So we're not talking about two kids. These are two old guys, but very. It's a very complex, complex situation where what are you going to do? You're going to overthrow President Biden and put who? Kamala Harris. Who no, do, that's who the do you have in there? In, no, in, that's in, the problem. Yeah, in the Democratic Party. And again, what do you think? If you have a leader that everybody believes, that everybody loves, who is as charismatic as hell, and everybody supports in the Republican side, what are you going to do about him? Replace him and then put who? No, I think put Trump is definitely going to be the right. Nikki the choice Haley, for the right. Even DeSantis, though, yeah. Mike Pence, what are you going to do? No, he's going to run through them like a bull. I okay, think. Exactly, yeah. like he did the previous times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The two previous times that he made it through. And, uh, I mean, the Clintons are gone now. It's not going to be them, uh, Hillary. And that basically, there is nothing... I think, I do believe that the Donald is coming back. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's that bad. Well, the, I don't... I, so he, let me give you my kind of very short overview of how I view this whole thing. When Trump was elected, I was in the camp that was appalled, that was shocked, just like... You know, all people, most people on the left. Uh, but then as time went by, I I don't know if it's because I started getting into like, there's something very interesting happens when you get slightly older. You start becoming not more conservative, but you have more appreciation for, for things that are effective versus things that you just know they might be the right vision, but you have to also look at what's possible right now. And that's kind of like, I guess, I guess you can call it conservative, but it's more just effective right because you've been around the block you start to understand that certain things like for example what bernie bernie sanders wanted to do i i would want to be with bernie sanders all the way which is i think yeah absolutely take care of the people who can't take care of themselves like all that stuff right such a liberal no no but yeah. but what i'm saying is is that as i got a, started getting into the middle of my 30s and later i all of a sudden started realizing okay but that's not if you look at the political situation right now, that's not realistic. And the way you're trying to approach these things, it's not going to happen the way you're trying to go about it because you still have to take into account that there's an opposition. There's like a lot of things that are happening. So my point is, is that I started all of a sudden this uh, confusion that I had about Trump being elected and everything started subsiding and it was replaced by even though I still find the person obnoxious, I wasn't appalled as much anymore. I was like, well, you know, the world is not falling apart. The economy doesn't look that crazy bad. Uh, so with all due respect, you have to approach the situation for what it is. So and even without respect. Yeah, even without appreciate. respect. His personal style. Listen, you know, this is the guy. This is what, he, what you see is what you get. That's what yeah. you say in America, right? Yeah. This is Donald Trump. O on the know? other hand, he is. So my, my, my point about that is that if he gets elected, I'm not so much worried about what he's going to do in office because right. I think that's okay. What I'm worried about or I'm interested to see is how it's going to influence the social tapestry. What's going to happen to the division again? Like, is it going to get crazy again? Is it going to get like this crazy division between the right and the left that is just like exacerbated by this, you know, figure in, in power? Uh, and considering the fact that also what's going on in the world at large now with Ukraine and Putin and all that stuff, that might put an extra pressure that then might actually send the country spiraling out of control. Like, I'm not sure that that, that would be the best outcome, honestly. I, I, think that, I think that what we have now is not, I, I don't think that's what needs to be in the political structure, but, but I think that Trump might actually make it worse just because he's gonna divide the people so much. So I'm very, you know, I'm very open to see what happens, but that's the thing that really, uh, that really kind of makes me worried. So the question that I have for you, which is something that kind of brings us back to Israel for a second, is that obviously there's a very big difference. A lot of people like to compare these, uh, you know, Trump and, and Bibi, for example. And it's like a hilarious comparison to me because it shows like this complete lack of understanding of what's actually involved. Be uh, Let's bring me to something that I really want to say. Sure, great. About, about yeah. the political scene and arena, both in the United States and Israel, 
and the comparison you're just starting to make. Great. So let's talk about that. Okay. Let so, me make, this is my take. Okay. As sure. an Israeli journalist that's been around for quite some time, that uh, did his degree in communication right here in Los Angeles three decades ago. I think, I seriously think, after exploring the American political scene for decades, for some five decades since I was a teenager, there is a problem with the system here. In America. And in Israel. Both systems do not work. So here's the reason why. When you say, you were telling me about how you were feeling when Trump was first elected back in 2016 over Hillary Clinton. But here's the thing. There is no way in any other democracy that I'm aware of, that I, that I know of, that he could have won those elections. She won the popular vote by 2.8 million votes. I mean, what does it mean? I mean, the system here, the Electoral College, is a system that in my opinion, with all the respect, you know, and I don't, you know, it's not me, I'm not going to tell the American public who's going to listen to me anyway, but this is something that does not work. It started back many years ago, and the last remember, the last example I remember before Trump and Hillary was uh, George W. Bush and Al Gore back in 2000, when they were fighting about those 516 votes in Florida for weeks and months in the Supreme Court and everywhere while it was there was no doubt that Al Gore won the popular vote by half a million votes. So now we have a situation where Hillary Clinton won by 2.8 million votes. It's unheard of. She should have been the president. And this has nothing to do and you know what? I don't even support her. She's not my cup of tea. Okay, maybe she might be representing some of the ideas I do believe in. I am liberal myself, I'm Israeli, I'm, you know, whatever. You know, we can talk about personal issues if you want later. But this is the thing. This thing does not work. Those 2.8 million votes, their voice was not heard. Because so, it's because the way that the actual final election worked. Let me put it in another word. Okay. Let's take California. We sit here in California, right? right. California is the biggest state. You have some 40 million, you have some, uh, uh, what is it, like uh, 60 delegates or something like that? 55 delegates. It's bigger than Texas, part. by the way? Yes. Oh, Yes, it's the biggest state in this. Okay. Yeah. It's actually the seventh economy of the world and everything. Yeah, I think the economy yeah. I know. Yeah. So, what do you mean when you say that Biden won, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the numbers of 2016, but let's say Hillary won... Of course, California, I got the 55 uh, electoral vote, but she should have won more than 55 electoral votes because she won by 10 million votes over Trump. What about those 10, with, with, the, with the one vote that gave her the majority, what about the other 9, 10 million votes? They don't count anymore because she already got the electoral college right, votes. Right. So it's, it's not very democratic. In Israel, just to make it short, there is a different, uh, there's another problem. I don't mean the to cut system, you off, but, but, but in America, it's actually a, a, a Republican democracy. So it's, it's supposed to be a little different, but continue. We can, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I would, I would assume... Republic, that, sorry, yeah. The, I would assume that the, uh, the, vote, the vote for president should be like voting for governor or senator it should be a nation a nationwide a nationwide choice hmm. i mean why somebody's vote from kentucky or arkansas or rhode island should be worth more than my vote here in california and in israel the the problem is the coalition you know bb why did he lose i mean he should have won i mean and i'm not a bb supporter i mean i'm not against him but i don't support him he should have won all those four recent elections that got Israel into this turmoil. We're going now into number five in two months or three months. So what's going to be the end? It's going to be the same. What you see is what you get. It's going to stay like that forever. It's a turmoil. Wait, but it's he was... But he because was... Nobody, because it should be a presidential vote. The winner takes it all, period. 
you wanna you wanna compete him, you should get a vast vast majority at the parliament to overthrow him and then go back to election or do the American way. Every second Tuesday of January of, uh, of November every four year period. But the, but isn't that the case that Bibi was also in power for a very long time before he lost? So obviously he, he was had, he was how long was he in power? 12 years and then and then and then three years earlier right and so he was 15 years altogether prime minister. So what is the thing because I'm, I'm actually uh, I, you need to educate educate me a little bit more because I'm actually not very connected to what what really happens in Israel. My sister is gonna hate me right now for this but but uh, the, the way he lost you saying it was not fair why because But what, what happened there that, that because he couldn't form a coalition because he didn't have this one vote wait so he won the popular vote you're saying is that what happened his party yeah. got as many votes as possible okay but some of his enemies gathered and made a coalition against him which is called in Hebrew as simple as Raklo Bibi Ralab. just not just not baby just not in baby. Translation, yeah Rak, there are two there are two major political powers in Israel nowadays it's been like that for the last decade or so Rak Bibi as opposed to Rak Lo Bibi only Bibi as opposed to just not Bibi yeah but it, but it, but don't so you think that the, that's the important the Bibi vote is going to be the Likud which is the biggest party I mean it's the biggest party come on they got the most of the vote and it's not a two three votes here and there they are 35 36 mandates in the parliament as opposed to Lapid who's the prime minister now he's got 20 votes he's got 20 members at the parliament now so what do you think should Bibi be prime minister or Lapid now Bibi has all the right-wing parties with him with the exception of his personal enemies Lieberman, Saar and Bennett with them together because their voters would have preferred Bibi over Bennett and Lapid But since it's political issues, it's personal hate and, uh, and, uh, and discrimination, now all those people, you know, all his political enemies gathered against him. And that's how he lost, he's losing over and over again. This is a very interesting thing because, because I think in politics, the biggest thing, at least in America, it's the, the popularity of the individual. Right. So like everything is set up, even in the election, like a popularity contest. And it's a known thing. And I had this conversation with uh, another guest previously on the show with um, Russell. Um, he has nothing to do with politics directly, but he's a, you know, he's a very interesting guy. And one of the things he said in the, in the interview is that he thinks that it might be okay with him that it is a popularity contest. Because in the end of the day, you have... The system, the way it's set up to operate, but then you have an individual that's supposed to basically represent the image that people believe in, and that's really the job of the president. Now we think of the president as like, well, he has to make very difficult choices and all of that, but he said the way that I see it, I don't see anything wrong with the fact that that individual just represents what most of the country wants to see in power. Right. So people feel like somebody is up there that they trust. And he, even though he does make a lot of the hard decisions, a lot of people help him to get to those decisions. So in the end of the day, the office wins and it doesn't really matter who the individual is as long as that individual is who the, the you know, most of the country picked. So I'm saying all of that because if... And there's a great example of what you're just saying. Which is... The election in France. There's uh, one guy against the other guy. Okay. And if there are multiple candidates, the two that get to the point where they get the first round... The two at the top, they go for a second round, no matter how much they got. Got it. Okay. And unless somebody gets 50%, I mean, 40% and up. So those two, and then, then it's, a, you know, 50-50. I mean, what a, that's how they win. The and, French, and then they, and then the they fight in a cage. Yeah. It's a French presidential, two rounds. It's all usually two rounds. But, but I'm saying this to the effect of, so what happened in Israel just now, right? If the fact that there was this movement even that had this attitude of like, just not Bibi, doesn't it say something about Bibi? 
like the fact that the he was there for 12 years and then there was a whole movement of people saying okay no more we can't take this anymore and they maybe he just learned how to play the political political game so well than everybody else that he manipulated the system in such a way that he would always win let me ask let sure you, i'm asking because yeah, i don't know i yeah. have a, i have a question for you sure in return sure why american president should be elected only for two terms let's say you don't think I it's like, a good thing let's say you know who were the last two terms president Obama Obama, president. Right. Obama. Obama and before Obama Bush, Bush. and before Bush Clinton let's say Clinton I like, was two terms? Let's, oh, I yeah, like to, like, yeah. let's say I like Bill Clinton let's say I like George W. Bush why shouldn't I elect him for the third term let the people choose It's but, but maybe the answer but maybe the answer is that if so my question was a genuine question I wasn't trying to suggest that it is true I'm asking you genuinely because you, you don't think it's, that baby was was prime minister for 12 or 15 years before no I'm asking something very asking specific why not so let me let me rephrase the question I'm sure you 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 saw uh, the again you you know you've been in the Israeli uh, concoction of, of political world for a very long time I'm sure you know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about that lecture when Bibi was young and he was giving this lecture I think it was In a little bit after you, yeah exactly MIT. and you exactly and you can see how he holds everybody by the balls right you, it, this individual is unique like he could speak like not a lot of people in this world can speak right and Now, if that is the kind of individual who can basically wrap everybody around their little pinky and make them believe whatever they want people to believe, but in action, when they are in power, they are doing something very different, then that would be the answer. I'm not saying that is the case. I'm saying, but if this would be the case, then that would be the answer of why it's better to only have a limited amount of terms. Maybe not two, maybe three, but there should be a limit. Because after a certain amount of time, that individual, or at least they need to be able to take a break. Like, we need a break from that individual. For, in Russia, for example, Putin could be elected only for two terms. Yeah, but Putin, that's put a bad Medvedev. example. Because in he, Russia, he put, that's not... He put Medvedev, and then he got back. Yeah, but Putin is like a complete... Like, Putin is a king. Like, he's, he's an actual, like, it's almost like a monarch, right? Yeah. Putin is not the same as, like, in, Russia is really a different situation. But I'm saying that in Israel, it's supposed to be a democracy, right? Yeah. So what I'm saying is that it's not that I, I have strong opinions about BB because I don't even live there, but I can totally see how if there's such a strong push against an individual, maybe there's, it's a good idea that the system would include a, 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 you know, some clause that says that, you know, okay, you're really good at what you do, either playing the political game or you're really good at actually doing the job, whatever the case may be, Here's nine years, here's eight years, here's whatever. Then you have to take a break for a couple of years or three years. And then we'll see. If, if things change for the worst, no problem. Come back and do it. If th- things ch- change for the best, hey, guess what? Maybe you were wrapping all of us under your little pinky and you're just a really good talker. And now we all believe a pie in the sky, but you're doing something completely different. So I can totally see how this would not necessarily be a bad idea. This is my answer to you. Like, why, why having limited uh, terms in, in government? And why having the electoral college system? Getting back to the first idea I made. Well, wait, what is the connection you're making there? Because the electoral college... But the the plus, idea there is the, the cance- size of the state, can- the amount can- of people in the state, right? Canceling, yeah. But okay. why, why is that? But, Doesn't but, it make sense? No, not to me. No. Oh. So why... I- If, if in California you have 40 million citizens yeah why they, their voice should be heard why their voice should yeah, be heard yeah their voice should be heard that's the idea that I was trying to make Because, earlier and this has nothing to do with the, the length of the term of the ruling uh, of the man in power so I'm not sure but I think the logic originally there was that a state has a certain kind of vibe right they have a certain thing they are around so like a certain industry a certain something let's say you Let's make an extreme example. That's not the case in California because there's a lot of different industries. But let's say there's some kind of an industry in California that would only lean left because of the nature of the industry. So there's some kind of an industry that benefits from the policies on the left. And because it's the biggest economy, so the incentive is economical, 
uh, they would always uh, left, vote yeah. left. And because there's so many people in yes. California, yes. then you're skewing the results because all these people are voting left, not because of the individual, but because of the policies on the left. So I think it but came the, into but co- the electoral of, college came into correct for something like that. I, I'm not sure if that's it. I know you're right, yeah. but still, I don't accept it. Okay. But what is the reason you like you think that it would actually still That's be better? That's the first it? problem. And the second problem is the uh, the two-term system of a ruling president. Why a senator? Okay, I did my study about the Kennedys when I did my degree here on political science and uh, communications. Okay. Um, president Kennedy of course was assassinated after 3 years, but his younger brother, Edward Kennedy, served in the U.S. Senate for 47 years until the day he died. 47 years. And he was one of the most brilliant. I mean, he was a Kennedy. He was a born star. He got into Senate at a very young age because he was brother of the president at the time, 1962. He was 30 years old. But he served for 47 years. And wait a minute. If people in the state of Massachusetts kept voting for him over and over and over again, and there were lots of examples like that. That's just the example that I came up with right now. When I'm saying, hey, why not? That's the people's choice. Had he done something wrong or bad, they could have replaced him. And there were lots of problems, and he was involved in many scandals. There was the Chappaquiddick case in which he killed this girl in his car. And, you know, Wait, just, why? Yeah. Who? Ted Kennedy, Senator he, Ted Kennedy. Really? Yeah, yeah, he joined with a car over the bridge in Chappaquiddick in Massachusetts. This woman died in his car. He, no, he, it wasn't until later that, later that morning that he rebuttal reporting the police that almost ruined his political career. He somehow got away with that. There is a, there's a famous movie to me you may want to watch, Chappaquiddick. Interesting. That's in a, yeah. But he was only in the Senate. But listen, he never he ran was, for office, he, right? He, 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 did, he, did, he had one attempt, and that was a big, big, major political mistake. In 1980, when Jimmy Carter running, was running for re-election, Ted Kennedy tried to uh, get the Democratic nomination on top of a sitting president. That was a mistake. They both lost hmm. to Ronald Reagan. So he didn't repeat it. But listen, that I want to go back to my previous question. He was a brilliant senator mm-hmm. that everybody on both sides of the aisle respected for all those decades, serving for 47 years. And I'm saying, why not? If he's good, keep him that way. And who's, who's deciding who's good and who's no, not? No, but the senator the is people, different. Right? The voter. Yeah. That's democracy, right? I see what you're saying. But I think that over time, see, the, the problem there, again, this, it's not like there's a perfect solution. And obviously, there might, be some, there might be a lot to what you're saying. But I think that in the end of the day, there is no perfect political system, just like there is no perfection in general. I think that the best system, uh, political system, would be a system that allows for f- flexibility of change according to the need of the people without... Uh, jeopardizing the integrity of the system in the moment. That will be the perfect one, right? So I personally think there shouldn't even be a president. I don't why, think... Why, why do you, why do you, why do you I don't think that? there should be one guy in charge. I think that's a mistake. I think I think that... Uh, one guy in charge of a bigger system. I don't... I think... I personally think it's a mistake. Why is that? Because one guy can never... There should be two people in charge. I think there should be... There should always be this kind of like... And, and the, the trick is is that they always have to learn how to come to some kind of an agreement. Yeah. And because, yeah. and that that would be the ultimate kind of like ruling system. Now, you know. So you have, you have, you have Congress, you have Senate, you have the two, uh, you have the House. There's too many individuals in those things to make a decision in real time. Like, for example, right now, if you need to invade a country, right? And let's say you have a very limited time to make the decision. One individual, okay, gets the advice. But I think two individuals, uh, they would... If the system set up in such a way that they listen to everybody and then they just go into a room alone, it's not three people. With three people, it's going to be impossible. But two individuals, if they go into a room alone, and again, you know, they already are in their positions because they 
they were elected to be able to also be reasonable. That, so people should also vote for people who are reasonable because if they can never come to a decision, the country will go to shit, right? So you want to pick individuals who can actually talk to each other and care about the country from maybe two different perspectives. One maybe a little bit more right-leaning, one a little bit more left-leaning, and then you have a consensus that is a little closer to what most of the country wants, and obviously it's never going to be. So That's very utopic. It's beautiful. I don't know saying. if it's utopic. It's I, think it's utopic. I think it's because doable. I think it's doable. Because the majority of one vote, basically, yeah. it's the winner takes it all. That's the idea behind That's it. That's how it is That's now. Right. I'm yeah. saying that I think it that needs to change. You can see it in every election. You know, This candidate carries can carry a state by like limited amount of votes, and he can still get... And he still gets... It doesn't matter. For example... Wait, 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 wait. I, I want to understand you. You're talking about in the, in, in the election yes. por- portion of it? I'm talking about, right now I'm talking about the, the why I think if this both, should be the case. If both candidates yeah. could work together, yeah. that's what you're meaning. But, but, you need, but my point is that the reason we don't vote for somebody who necessarily would be reasonable is because they don't actually have to answer to people to a large extent outside for the election. But if they have to answer to somebody around every decision, which is the other individual who has the same weight as them, now you have something way more balanced, the way that I see it. I think it's completely possible that when you have a serious situation, the two adults will sit down with a deep understanding of the situation, listen to all the experts together. Two minds in this case, I think, is better than one. I think that they would be able to make a decision quick enough. But I'd like to go back to something that I'm more familiar with. Okay, I'm which not is... Gonna, you know, I can... My view as an Israeli reporter living, residing in the United States, as of the American political system can be anything, but it wouldn't make much difference. I do... What, what do you mean by that? It's... I'm not going to be able to change anything because I am... I'm, I'm, I'm viewing the American political arena from the eyes of an Israeli hmm. who lived most of his life here. I'm like, I mean, not here in Israel. I'm here just for the last three years. Right. Here's the point I'm trying to make. Sure. We were starting talking earlier in this conversation about the media and the coverage of anything, news, period. Right. And this is something I'm more familiar with. Sure. And I like, you know, I made these ideas about the Electoral College on the, on the term of the... Uh, of the elected president, and you're talking about the role of the president, whether or not he should rule by himself. I would love to go back to the media and the power of the media. Absolutely, the sure. And we are living through this unbelievably amazing knowledge information revolution that started with the invention of the digital some 30 years ago, the internet, and keeps going on and on and on. I mean, you see all those polls, you see all this information about the younger generation that does not watch television anymore the way we used to when we were younger, definitely me. And people, I mean, the printed media is almost dead. Who's getting, are you subscribed to any printed newspaper? Uh, I don't. Do they exist? Of course. Oh, really? See, see, yeah. So that's my answer to you. Can, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, you didn't know they existed. I know. No, but they're on yeah. the internet. The New yeah. York Times. You read on the internet, right? Yeah, you can still get the print version right the, the, on your door that's every crazy. morning if you want to. No, no problem. No matter where you live, even around the world, it's not a problem. And my question is, where do we go from here? That's the biggest question. That's the biggest question that I keep thinking a lot of. Because you watch Where does this end, basically, this craziness? You see the old-fashioned media right. struggling to survive in the arena of all the social media, mm-hmm. gaining power from day to day. Mm-hmm. So it might be Twitter, it might be TikTok, it might be Facebook. Ooh, course. news on TikTok, that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. You already <laughs> have it. You have really? It? Yeah, of course. What do you mean? Yeah, you have news in, in, in like yeah, you have all this quick news, and you know where people get it, get the news from, you know from from the um, from social networks, like um, like WhatsApp. You, you that I know. You yeah. join all those groups, and what you see. Telegram. Group, yeah, exactly. That's where you get your information from, and you don't know how I know it because they ask kids. How do you know? I saw it on TikTok. I saw it on WhatsApp. Interesting. 
So where does it end? You know, I, I, I thought about it a lot of myself. Actually, I think I asked you this at some point in our private conversations where I asked you if you see the... Uh, so, for example, you still write articles and you go on shows and you talk about things and you also do commentary in general. And I read a lot of the stories that you write and one thing becomes very obvious quickly. I don't know if it's because you have so many years of experience um, or just because you already have a, a certain um, gravitas, a certain impact on people because they know who you are and your audience is the people that already know who you are and they would consume what you, what you would write. But even as somebody who's just reading it from the most objective way that I can, it's interesting, but also it's not hyperbolic. Like it's, it, it, you write in a way that is loyal to the facts even though you inject, you know, like some, to think so. some, well, I'd you do, like you do so. inject some zings and zags, you know, you, you do inj inject some personal opinions here and there, but yeah. it's very, uh, but classy. I, like there's I'd no, like to believe that I'm sticking to the facts. That's very important. We just mentioned. Yes. But what I'm saying is that I'm, I'm trying to distinguish this from what's going on in the media now, which I can totally understand the model because the mo they have to compete, like you said, with all the social media, which is based on sensationalism and on, on hype, hyperbole and a lot of drama. So if you don't do something along those lines, you simply lose eyes. You lose, people won't be interested. So you have to be hyperbolic. You have to skew the facts or you have to say things in a way that way more colorful than the, the, the actual thing is, right? But somehow you manage to keep loyal to the facts, but also not keep it totally, interesting. Not totally. Not, not totally 100%. what? Uh, still, people who prefer the old way media. So that's yeah. what I'm saying. Maybe, But for me, as a reader who don't necessarily identify as any of that, right? I still find it interesting. And I wonder if it's just because, I don't know, maybe I'm still kind of, maybe I belong to the old generation already at this point. But... Maybe the younger kids are not interested in that, but I, I wonder if there's a way for reporters to still make the point like the old way, like make the point for what it is, but not make it boring. Like I can totally see that there would be a middle ground there, but somehow people just lose the plot and they just kind of marry themselves to this, you know, again, clicks count, right? Yeah. So. Of course. So, right. So I oh, think. Maybe only clicks count. Maybe only clicks count, but I think that we need to set up a different system or to think how to do that that would incentivize reporters and networks to produce content that is more loyal to the facts right. and is not boring. Yeah. Or maybe it's the type of individuals who occupy those those positions at this point. But I think so. Okay, one of the things that kind of came to my mind, and you tell me what you think about that. Right? It's actually it actually leads me to one of the questions I wanted to ask you. You reported on war a lot. On what? Right. On war. Yeah. Right. So you were in, you know, in actual, like, I in, was in war, wars. covering the war, right? I was covering war. Which is a very different kind of reporting than just regular reporting, because right. there's, a, there's a whole thing that goes into that. Uh, actually, the question that I wanted to ask you were a little bit more personal on the level of, like, do you feel that, that those, those kind of reporting jobs changed your perception uh, you know, of humans in general, but, but I guess this connects us nicely to what we're talking about now. I feel that when you have certain stakes of human affairs that you report on, then the things that are more fluff, the things that are more like, you know, just hyperbole for no reason becomes unthinkable because if you're there when you see carnage and you're reporting on this and you see like people suffering on that level then going back and making a story that belongs more in a tabloid than on a news network doesn't make any sense it's almost like there's so much crazy shit going on why would i then amplify this thing that doesn't even matter seems to be right so the in question your eyes. It doesn't matter in your eyes. Well, no. It does I, matter in somebody else's eyes. Because they never saw something on a level of, of impact. Then that you is more and than me that. can yeah. be at the same time, at the same place, regardless if it's a war or not. Okay. And you can see two different things. Sure. And report, and that is what actually happens. All the time. So here is the thing. Yeah. Living in the United States nowadays, watching, let's say, the two major networks that I'm familiar with, CNN versus Fox News, you turn, you turn both of them on 
And what do you get? Do Complete you get, opposite, right? Do you get news? You don't get news. No, you get two opposite. It's opinions. It's yeah. opinionated networks that basically reflect the ideas of the broadcasters and the presenters and probably the policy of the network itself and its shareholders. It's so nothing that's the that key it, right it there, the shareholders. To do with, it's nothing... It's nothing... It has nothing to do with... Uh, and the public also. On public TV and radio, both in Israel, the British, the, the, the classic British way, the BBC, or the NPR or PBS here, you also... You, it echoes the ideas of the reporters, the editors, and the presenters. So you choose whom you want to believe. And little by little, people pick their... It's not that I'm going to be turning on CNN and get the news. If I'm liberal, I'm going to be watching CNN. If I'm Republican, conservative, I'm going to be probably going to be watching Fox News. Right, because and you want it. people who agree with what you already feel. So, But, so but, but the reason that I find so, it so problematic is because, at least in America, the media is supposed to be the fourth arm of the government. It's actually a branch of the government. It's supposed to be part of how the government operates. I don't think Push, so. Well, it's supposed to be. Why? It's, Why, Why do you think so? It's a, no, I don't think so. That's how it's set up to be. It's actually I don't think so. Why is it set up to be that way? I don't think it's the way it's supposed oh, to be. Oh, no, absolutely. The media no. is supposed to be the thing that challenges the government in all its aspects. So even though you have the, you know, the Supreme Court, the Senate, uh, the president... It's not a branch of the government. Well, it's supposed to be... It's I considered don't to think be, so. You don't I, think so? It was ever. I don't not, think that the not, news not were always like this. It's an independent branch that has nothing to do with the government. Well, no, not paid uh, by the government, the, but right. Because the public, the public system in Israel and in some, in most of the Europe, Western European countries is being paid by the government and that was been a problem. To basically no, no, not paid directly. I mean, it is considered to be part of the operation of what the uh, what, the thing that keeps part of the checks and balances of the government. Yes. Basically, it's supposed to be the thing that puts the pressure on the government when any branch of the government is doing the wrong thing or asks the right questions for the public. You don't think that that's that's a that's a that's the position that the media should be fulfilling? Media should be independent. Period. Right. However, is it really independent? I don't think so. It's either being paid or sponsored by the public directly or indirectly through the government branches, the financial, right, right. The financial system, or being sponsored by uh, commercial powers. Hmm. So you have sponsors. If Coca-Cola is sponsoring my show, I'm probably not going to be criticizing Coca-Cola or PepsiCo or McDonald's. So this is an interesting... Or Toyota. So this is something very interesting to me. When you, when you, the influence of uh, different opinions and, and, and money, for example, you would be, you would consider yourself a liberal, right? Yeah, I would like to think so, okay. yes. Okay. So in Israel, when you would go and report or make a story with uh, a right-wing um, uh, individual in the government, do you feel that you would conduct your interview differently? In what, mean, in what meaning? Do you feel that your political views would influence the type of interview you're going to conduct with that individual? Because they are on the opposite I'd like party. To think, I'd like to think that doing, doing a political show, doing the news in a place like Israel, that's where I'm from, and I did it all my life. Let's say I'm a liberal and I'm hosting you in my show and you're liberal too. Okay. Would I betray my job? Would I be flattering you? Will I be asking you nice questions? Will I try not to be hard on you? No. And I had difficult times, if you want to get some story from my personal experience, where people from left-wing parties, people that I've, that I've known for quite some time, sometimes for social circles that we meet, would be mad. Why I was asking them all those questions? Why I was tough on them? That's my job. Hey. Okay, so your answer is that no, you would still do your job first. And of course, yeah, I would do my job first. Yes, of course. Okay, but that's not that. See, yeah. this is what I mean. That today, it's not that obvious at all to people. Like, you seem to have this, like, completely... You you, you, you didn't really answer my question originally, which I, w I really want to take, take your take on that. Yeah, do you feel that in Israel, you, you have a similar problem in the media that you have here? You said yes, but in what way? Because I feel like whenever I would have a glimpse of the Israeli whatever, they're a little bit more, seem to be a little bit more objective in the way that they talk. 
they don't seem to have the same emotional kind of thing going on. When, no, you, you have been watching news in Israel yeah, okay. for quite some time. Let me tell you, so nobody yeah, please, thinks. No matter where you're politically, where you're located politically in Israel, nobody thinks that the, you know the media is objective anymore. Interesting. But here's the thing: while in the past all the media was left wing, basically liberal against Likud and Bibi, of course, things changing in the past decade or so. You have these new channels. You have Channel 14, which is like a total right-wing news channel in Israel. You have all those newspapers. You have columnists and you have reporters, right-wing reporters in the left-wing media. Hmm. Like Amit Segal, for example, or El Segal, or Boaz Bismuth, or, uh, or uh, Lital Shemesh, or, uh, or um, Amnon Lord. You have lots of them around. Or Kalman Liebeskind. You have many of them. Okay. So and they and that's set up reflect, this re, They reflect right-wing right uh, ideas that are, listen, let's face reality. You know, I'm, I don't know if I'm left-wing. I'm definitely liberal. I'd like, to t- I'd like to think of myself as somebody in the middle, if there is such thing in political, you know. I, I wish there would be. I can explain why, but this is not the point. The point is that there is a change going on. And if we were asking previously about what changes we can expect in the future for the media, this is part of it. It's changing. It's changing. It's not the way it used to be anymore. However, the problem with the digital media that I see is whether or not you can trust this. And can you trust this? In what way? You have those bots. Right. Oh, the bots way. Why? Why is Elon Musk uh, uh, trying to uh, break the deal with Twitter? He said, I don't know if it's true, he said that they were hiding numbers or they were not disclosing or they were not true about the fact of how many fake accounts and bots they have. Right. And that's that might be as high as 80%. We were talking about Trump 2016. All the American agencies later on came and said, he won through putting all these false media reports about Hillary in American uh, social media system. Yeah. All those fake No, it's, those very, fake it's very accounts. plausible, yeah. So where is it leading us to? I mean, you mean like, is it going to like this weird doom? A lot of people are worried about this, just like you. Can I... Can I take this conversation to a different course now? Of course. We are doomed. And you know why? Why? When you said that word, it came back to my mind. This is the thing that scares me more than anything else. Which is? You know, there's a, firm, there's a famous saying that a gun that shows in the first act of a play would shoot in the third act. Here is the gun, the nuclear power of the world. There are some 11,000 nuclear, hydrogen, and mass destruction bombs around the world, mostly in, the, in Russia and the US. Some in France, UK, Israel, so they say. <laughs> India. What do you mean, so they say? No, it's pretty open, Israel, isn't it? Israel, Israel never admitted. So. Really? Yeah, Israel. I never, did not know that. Israel never, ever admitted. That is interesting. It's, okay. uh, they, they keep it this way. We, not, we never said yes. We I did not know that. No. So Israel yeah, is not Shimon, officially... Shimon Peres, yeah. who was the most clever guy ever in Israeli politics, he was asked one time, Mr. Peres... How many, does, does Israel actually has nuclear bombs? So you know what his answer was? It doesn't matter. Although he spoke like that with a <laughs> Polish thick accent. He said, it doesn't matter what Israel has or does not have. It matters what people think they have. <laughs> wow. So back to the point. Interesting, yeah. We're living in the nuclear age. I live, you came from the Soviet Union. I live in Israel. We all know what the Cold War used to be. And the threat of a nuclear war between the East and West. So 
I, w- I never believed that in 2022 I would hear Russian and American officials threatening each other a nuclear war. And guess what? I woke up yesterday and there's a new player that we haven't mentioned yet. China. North. Oh, I thought North Korea. Threatening yeah. the US in a war if Nancy Pelosi goes to visit Taiwan next week. Really? Yes. Wait. Just because a political individual... No, just because will... there's an issue with Taiwan. That you right. But, but, but in this point, like just because now we're going to send an individual that they threatening because with nuclear war? No, it, they never said nuclear war. But, you know, it's the, it's the war of words behind the actual war. Mm. It's a diplomatic war where when you say all cards are on the table and you know what the cards are, you're familiar with what power China or Russia or the U.S., what, what actually stands behind those words, you are afraid that something might happen. So, here's the thing. The world had nuclear power since 1945. USA used this power to finish the war with Japan. We know all the history, we know we're not going to get into that right now, because you can debate about that too. We are now in 2022, and that's the most important part of our conversation, my dear friend, Dali. It's not where the media is taking us, and it's not whether or not the Electoral College is going to make the difference in American presidential elections. It's whether or not, or should I say when, there will be a nuclear war in this world again. So you're and sure I'd that... I'd like to think I'm wrong, but I'm afraid there will be one. So first, just to offer a small correction, which is it wasn't a nuclear war before, it was a nuclear attack, which is very different than nuclear war, and thank God it wasn't a nuclear war. It's not, again, I we're not going to debate... war. American used nuclear power in order to finish the war with Japan. Yeah, yeah. So you hope I mean, that there will never be a move like that again, but you're saying that from what you're saying, you don't see any other way right now. You took it to the extreme. Well, like, it sounds like, like you're convinced. I'd like to so, make my point sure. as follows. I am afraid that someday somebody will do something that we all going to regret. If we're going to stay long enough to be able to regret. Right. Because there is so much hatred in this world. There's so much animosity between different powers that have gathered so much destruction power in their arms. And it's not just nuclear power. It's even the cyber power that people can use, mm-hmm. that different nations use. Which can even, be even, even more dangerous. As, as we speak. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I hope, I, I wish I'm wrong, but I'm afraid that there will come a day where either a sovereign country, a nation, or a terrorist power, like ISIS or Hezbollah or Al-Qaeda, will acquire the ability to hold nuclear power and use it in a very different, in in, in many different ways. Because if you have the Korean guy from Pyongyang, you know, threatening, he's literally threatening, I just read the other day, threatening the US again in using his nuclear power against the United States in the way he might find appropriate that, you know, what's going to be, what's going to be next? Yeah. The second, the first trigger is pulled and kind of like all bets are off, especially. I'm afraid that there is so much nuclear destructive power, weapons of mass destruction. There is an America invaded Iraq back in 2003. There is so much power in this world that someday somebody will make the mistake of using it. And of course, it's going to be the, uh, the next move, the second strike. Why Israel needs all those submarines? Why the U.S. have these strategic submarines? Because even, even if somebody, and the hell knows who, either Korea or Russia or China, destroys the United States totally, completely, there are enough submarines deep in the oceans, in both oceans, 
to destroy the rest of the world. If oh, yeah, they yeah. You, you don't need that I'm many. I'm sorry I that think... I hear, I'm, I'm, I sound apocalyptic, I know, I'm aware, I know exactly what I'm saying. I'm just trying to put in words some of my nightmare thoughts. Sure. So with first, my experience that you kept mentioning, absolutely, and I take your your opinion very in high regard in that in that sense. Um, so first, I, I I believe that the number in order to actually make life on the planet unlivable is very very small. I think it's like twenty, eleven thousand nuclear bombs. Well, you don't need Danny those. Goller, my no, no, friend. No, 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 but eleven I think thousand you, nuclear yeah. bombs. Why? Who needs them? Why are there so many nuclear bombs? Well, those are questions that we, you know, we can ask all day long. I think that the, the point is, like you're saying, is like move, looking forward. Again, you need no more than 20 or 30 of them to de- detonate to make life on this planet uninhabitable. Well, the magnitude with the power of the most developed one, even less. So to that, first of all, I do share your concern to some extent, but I think that for me personally, I because it's so big and there's so little that I can do about that well basically there's nothing I can do about that right um, I all you all I can do is just live my life as if this is not a thing that will happen so I would want to do things in this world that will create a better world and if it happens I mean that would be horrific obviously but I would like to believe that you With all the hatred that that and animosity that you're mentioning, I would like to believe that there's also the other component that is growing exponentially, which is the the connective element, which people the internet has its bad qualities, but the internet also has this capacity to connect people from all over the world and see each other as more human and not as less human. And that it has also been the case in other trends. Now, which one of those will win in the end? Only time will tell. I am, just like you, very concerned about the specifics of what's going on right now with Putin because if you push a guy that feels like he has nothing to lose, this is something this is a point that Jordan Peterson recently made, which is that people say we want Putin to lose. And then he said, well, what do you think this will look like? Do you think Putin will just fold up and die? No, if Putin will lose, we all lose with him because if he gets to a point where he feels like that's it for him, He There's nothing that might, stops might, him from doing that, right? Might, and at might, that point, at that point, that's it. Know. Then it's exactly what you're saying. All, all hell then, will break loose. And then there is one more thing. Thanks for mentioning Putin again. Because there is this margin of error. What, what, what would be the margin of error? Putin keeps saying, and there's just him, you know, his defense secretary, uh, Shoigo, and Lavrov, the foreign minister, they keep saying repeatedly, And all the spokespeople from the Zaharova, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or the other guy. Any intervention, direct intervention of Western forces in the war in Ukraine would cause immediately a total war yeah. between Russia and NATO. Yeah. A total war, if my ears are clean enough, is nuclear war. That might be mutual, total mutual destruction. That's what I'm hearing. Well, total- Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if necessarily means that so, because I think this would be as a last resort I think total war means that's it they're engaged in actual war, so hot what, war what happens if something happens by accident what do you mean by accident if a Russian missile falls in Poland or Romania uh, you, you're talking about a nuclear one or it just no, no but that a, matters a regular this detail a regular, man, okay, yeah. a regular missile yeah. you know one of those missiles that keep you know targeting all those Ukrainian cities what happens if God forbid by mistake you I mean, just by mistake, you know, those Russian loyalists in eastern Ukraine shot down a Malaysian plane a couple of years ago, killing 270 people. Did the war And start from that? No. I mean, it, that, was the, that was the point where the world became aware of the war that was going on for years on eastern Ukraine. Okay. When they shot down the Malaysian plane flying from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. Mm-hmm. You know, the but, but the war images. didn't start from that. No, there, there was, there, there was a, it started long before, and uh, it started where the point where Putin got to the idea, to get to the conclusion that this was a mistake to uh, let Ukraine or maybe other countries, which used to be part of the Soviet Union, join NATO. And he has his points. No, I didn't. Yeah. I am not a communist, I'm not pro-Putin, and I'm, a, yeah. I'm not, no, no. 
But listen, he has some points. Why is the West approaching Russia? Why Lita, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, Hungary, not Hungary, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Romania, why all the Bulgaria, why they all need to be members of NATO? Who's threatening them? Why, you know, what, what, what was what the tip point? What was the point? Well, he proved who's threatening them with invading Listen, Ukraine. Putin, on the night he started the war, this, you know, it's, it, they don't call it war, they call it a special military operation yes. in Ukraine. He made a speech. To NATO? I NATO? To, I, to Na- I, wait, wait, the one to NATO? He made, he made the, to NATO? To the world. To Russia and the world. Right, but he knew that that's something that the NATO would never oblige. So listen, it was one-way street. Listen, listen. Yeah. But what I was listening, there was this, this Russian uh, channel in English, RT. Right. I was listening to all his speech. Okay. The 40 minutes of all in his entire speech. He made a point that I was listening to very carefully. Would the Americans agree that Mexico would sign a treaty with Russia and we got, they're going to have... Russian soldiers on the on the American border with Mexico? No, I, I agree. Would with the American that agree? Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah. Americans were ready to go to war six decades ago when the Russians put missiles in Cuba. In Cuba, yeah. Yeah. No, that is a that is a very sovereign point. The only thing is that I think that the individual in question, just because of who he is. Uh, tells you a lot about the things that he uh, is willing to do versus the American. Uh, I would say that with all the shit we have here, I think it is fair to make a distinction between what the general operative interests of America are and the general operative interests of Russia are or of Putin are. And they are different. Should he have invaded Ukraine? I don't think so. Should, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think. Yeah, that, but something made him got him to the point that you mentioned earlier that he has no other choice but go to war. No, at this point, yeah. Like at this point, this is a very, very bad situation. So I guess my my point to you is is that first of all, I share your concern in that regard. Um, but but I think that I would like to believe that even if there is some kind of a mishap that almost makes it happen then the country who got, you know, bombed or attacked or whatever would have still enough sensibility to kind of look at the situation and say, you know, is it worth destroying the entire world for? So now you can't really hope for that. But I mean, what 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 other things you can do? Like we are already in this situation. You know, you do believe that somebody is operating using the common sense and logic that you're using. I would like to hope so. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that there that's necessarily no, going to be the there case. There is no guarantee. No, no guarantee. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, ne- the, ne- the next thing we can rely on is on aliens to stop it. So, well, there's... <laughs> there's... Let's, let's go for that. <laughs> well, no, because, you know, there, there was now uh, some cases that, uh, that are actually reported by uh, official military silos where... Those whatever they are, they do fly over, and a few times they stopped nuclear reactors. So you know who knows. Uh, it is actually an interesting subject because it's a weird one to lump into what you're saying, which sounds like a serious thing, which because it is. But uh, what's your as as a serious reporter who only reports on things of like you know terrestrial affairs? Uh, if you would have to make a wild speculation, what do you think? Do you, do you think that this is this can po- possibly be something? Like all those sightings from actual so, pilots and all that stuff, the UFO phenomena. Do you so feel that something look, might be there? Looking at the past, so far, for the eight decades or so that the world has or had had a nuclear power, logic won so far. Logic has won. But my fear is that forces that do not necessarily think the way we do will eventually be able to get the to acquire weapons of mass destruction that might change reality and might have might drag 
the forces, the old-fashioned forces, the forces the way we'd like to believe they are, into something that nobody wants. What my, what my thoughts are, right now, the, it's difficult, it's difficult to predict. There's, you know, Israel used to have a prime minister, Levi Eshkol, who was a very, very clever guy. He used to say, it's difficult to predict, especially for the future, about the future. So my, my belief is that as for the time being, the war in Ukraine will be detained somehow. And listen, the Ukrainians are going to have to compromise because there are territories in the East that the Russians do believe that belong to them because the majority of the population there is Russian. Yeah, they speak Russian and everything. They identify with Russia way more, right? And, that, and the Crimea was Russian to begin with. Stalin gave it to the Ukrainian as a gift. I don't get it, you know. It's, and I'm not justifying anybody. I'm just looking at each in everybody. I'm looking at everybody's arguments. So eventually, eventually, because the Russians still do already think in a Western way, they have too much to lose. They need to feel like they want something for this to go away, basically. And, and listen, it, you're going to have to give them the feeling that they have one. To some extent. This is not going to work. And it's, it's not even Putin. Putin alone could not have done this. And this is a problem. This you is think a so? This is a mistake that the West is doing. Wait, you really think so? Putting all the blame on Putin. It's not putting all the blame. It's understanding that the, the circles of power that he created, make, they're not manageable. You make, from the, you make things easier for yourself to consume the phenomenon called Vladimir Putin. It's like saying that the, the Holocaust and World War II, was, there was one person to blame. Hitler. It's not true. You can't do that. Hitler was the masterminder. He was the ruler. He was the fearer. He was whatever you want to say he was. Whatever you think. But, you know, just putting the blame on him? I don't think it's true. And Putin is the same situation right now. We don't, you know, don't make the comparison. He's not a mass murderer. He's not, you know, he's not what Hitler used to be. But just let me ask you, as somebody who came from the Rus- from Russia, from mm-hmm. the Soviet Union, how can it be that a person is 22 years in charge, mm-hmm. he's the president of such a big and important country, must somebody must be supporting him? There no, a lot of people powers do. around him. Yeah, but they believe things about him that are came like they come to their conclusions through very deep propaganda. That's also true. Like, they put out information to the public that is not at all what, in fact, is going on in the world and, or the relationship that Putin has with the world or what he's doing for the country. And, I mean, the situation there might be a little bit more difficult because it is true that without a very strong hand, Russia is controlled by oligarchs and, and you know, very, like, black money and things like that. So maybe Russia does need a strong leader that kind of leads it like that. But on the other hand, yes, maybe people are electing him, but the fact that if somebody is opposing him ends up poisoned on an airplane, that should tell you everything. That's not a, that's not a democracy. That is a very different kind of system. It, it, as much as you want to disagree with Trump, most likely you're not going to end up poisoned on an airplane. He might tweet something nasty at wow. you. Well, what? Did you read CIA stories? Uh, sure. Did you watch about the CIA democracy, what, you know, what the American, Americans did in different, different sure. parts of the world? Sure. But I think that it's still a little different than, like, there are corruptions in power for sure. There's a difference, though, I always say, there's a difference between corruption in power and corrupted power. And I think Russia is corrupted power. There's just, there's no more, like the circles of power that Putin created around himself, uh, they are s- constructed in such a way that the rest of whatever can influence it from like the regular people is so far away removed that it's not a democracy in any sense. Because any real opposition to that point of view will get you either in prison or killed. Like, it's actually illegal to carry certain signs in Russia. That's not, there's no freedom of speech. Maybe, maybe, 
Well, there are, there is, it, it would be illegal to carry certain signs both in America and no, Germany it, too. No, it isn't. In America, no. No. No, no. You, no, in America you can carry any sign you want. Any sign you want. Any sign you want. Any sign. Yeah. Anti-Semitic sign. Yes. Nazi sign. Yes. Well, in public. You have, yes, yes, yes. You can have an organized That's rally of Nazis. Yes. There are, and they were, again, now the thing's a little different only because of the way that the media is handling things, which not, is not necessarily a bad thing, but... Uh, you had organized neo-Nazi rallies on the streets, organized and protected by the police, and it's not because they were supporting it. It's because that is a, that's an assembly, and you have the right for an assembly. That's it. And that is actually the difference between what America allows and the situation in Russia or anywhere else. In Israel, obviously, maybe, it's going to be different. So it's only emphasizing what I was thinking before. Which is? Maybe Russia is not the country that was meant for democracy. Then maybe this is a society. And you tell me, like I said before. I haven't lived there long enough to actually listen, have Listen, but you know, you follow. Uh, you have not necessarily. No, no, that. no. I have, uh, yes, I have family there. From what I understand from my family is that they would tell you that some would tell you that they understand that there's this other thing and they're not being told what that other thing is, but there's nothing they can do about it. That's what they would tell you. The other people would tell you what you're saying right now, which is that they just support him and like, hey, you know, he's good. The power seems to be structured. Moscow seems to have being developing. So everything looks good. My mom just went there and she was kind of like telling me, you know, it looks great. It looks normal. The city is popping. I'm like, okay, great. Now, is there a skewed reporting about what the actual situation in Russia is in the American media? I'm sure of it. But I, I tend to look at the but individual. You the point, Danny. What is the point? The point is maybe the Russian society is not, was not meant maybe. for democracy. Maybe. Listen, they had the Tsar system right. until the Bolshevik Revolution. Then you had the Bolsheviks, then the, uh, the communists... And then you had the anti-communist revolution, the Glasnost and the Perestroika, and then the overthrow of the communist regime. Right. And you have kind of democracy or Western-oriented regime for the last three decades. So maybe, maybe, just maybe, Russia is not the country that would appreciate not just Russia, Hungary, Poland. All those countries for the, three, for the last three decades. But it still needs a way to operate in the may, larger... And maybe not just them, maybe Turkey too. Listen, look at the guy in Turkey. Okay, been, but those countries still need to be able to operate within the larger picture of what the world is, right? Even if they're not fully democratic or not democratic at all, if they don't exist as, as players that the world can rely on to have a conversation with, or at least the people in power, then that is... A dangerous country like North Korea is not a situation you can't say well maybe North Korea is uh, just meant to be uh, this crazy prison for people anybody who North lives Korea there right? is an exception a scary exception right but, but my point is that not all systems you would just accept them on face value because that's what the, works for that country in that moment right so there's we can criticize that system even though it's not our country because right. it still belongs in the world, and we live in the world, and therefore there's a larger picture we have to all look at, basically. That, that's my point. Right. Yeah. So, so in the end of the day, yes, you're right. There might be a situation in which a country might actually be better off with a, with a dictator to some extent. But if that dictator, dictator is not one that can have a rational conversation with the rest of the world, then the rest of the world has a say in it. That, that, that's, my, that's my only point in there. That so, so what, what do you think? How, how, how do you see this situation in Russia and Ukraine? I think, think this is a will test. Will be resolved? I don't think, well, that I have no idea. But I, I do know this. Uh, the way that I see it, that the, the situation with, between Russia and Ukraine right now is a test. It's a test for the world to see what we think about this way of conducting yourself. If we allow... Now, again, this is to make very clear that it's not like I have some kind of a magical solution. I understand the, the complexity of the problem. But it seems to me that it's almost like we need to declare whether we tolerate a behavior like that anymore. And if we're going to say yes and we're going to allow this to unfold, then I think we're going to have more of those in the next century. Or we decide, you know what, enough is enough. And we're going to either find a clever way to end this, talk to Ukraine and say, hey, make concessions. You know, this is for the, we know this is very like a big lose for you, but 
maybe in the long run for the world it will be a win maybe address it this way or hey you know what maybe tr take them out like it, it's like at a certain point you have to make a decision it's like there's only so far you can be pushed in a certain direction and i think the climate in the world is something that we all decide how it's going to look like we have to make that decision for us as a, as, as a world now until now we weren't thinking along those lines but i think now we're going to start moving to other planets or at least to mars for now so we will start th have to be thinking in terms that are a little bit more global like what actually works for us as a global society not just for this country or that country or that climate country. crisis climate crisis all of those things would have to actually be addressed from the world at large and if there are pockets of the world that are just not players you can ever talk to like north korea right like you said they're like a crazy outlier right but they are an outlier that have eventually will have to be dealt with you, you, that's not gonna go away uh unless they manage to deal somehow there's always the something that you can't see what whether do you mean or not that? whether or not the South Koreans together with the Americans will manage to overthrow that regime How? That scary regime in the north well war is the only way Korean Koreans is one nation you know it's only in the eyes of the West that wait a second wait a second okay this I, I gotta listen to this because this is against everything I understand about yes. the situation there okay there is one Korean people that was divided into north and south that's true communist or yeah, the, uh, but now they're completely uh, different countries, basically. I don't know about that. They, they are, you know, because they have been like that for 70 years. But listen, <laughs> East and Ger West Germany were also, these are one these, these are one people that was divided by force. But, but no, wait a second. No, that, that is not entirely true. Because when when two portions of one country are divided, not just by the, the parameters of the geography, but also by the ideals. Political powers. Yes, yeah. political, but also the ideals that the people they're in them carry. Those are different same, countries. They're now. still, they're both, they're both Korean. They're both Korean people S speaking. But genetically, it doesn't mean people, anything. People speaking the same language. Again, doesn't mean much. People can be speaking the same language and massacre each other. We see, this is just true throughout in the entire history. You yeah, know, but you, they are one people. It's in, not in what way? Are, it, you they, keep saying they, that they in do one not way. consider themselves one. Yeah, by the way, they can. They it, don't consider themselves they, the same they, people. They, they they do. They don't consider. They don't recognize each other's independence. South Korea believed that the North should be part of the South. Because also, they want to control it. They want, you know, we are one big nation, one big Western-oriented liberal country that should, should but be But how come democracy. they allow what's happening in North no, Korea to happen it's then? It's not up to them. That, so that, if it's not up to them, they're there, not one there, nation. There was a war 70 years ago. Yeah. And Wait, but if it's not up to them, war. how is it one nation? Because they are one. They, they, they in what sense are they one nation? In what sense? By their identity as Koreans. But that's not enough to define some. So, okay, so for it example, in no, it isn't. No, I don't Look, agree. Look, in Africa, I know, I know, you don't agree, and this is great. In Africa, for example, you have a lot of tribes that yes. are genetically, language-wise, something different. No, they're no, different they're exactly story. the same, exactly different the same. Story. But they're just murdering each other indiscriminately because they feel like they're completely other because, because they have the, different ideas. These are tribal societies that have been fighting with each other ever since. But the country is just a big tribe, isn't it? A, yes. Okay. But that tribe was artificially divided by political power. What do you mean by artificial? Isn't political power a part of how a nation operates? Why is it artificial? Because there was... By the way, I have a, a better example for you. Okay. There was a war until four, four and a half decades ago, not very far from Korea, in Vietnam. Okay. There was North Vietnam and South Vietnam that kept fighting with each other. Terrible, terrible war that went on for some 15 years. Okay. Actually, yeah, 15 years okay. or 14. From, depends how you, depends when you start counting. South Vietnam and North Vietnam? South Vietnam and North Vietnam okay. until the North captured the South. Americans basically gave up. They left. After a while, South Vietnam fell. It was a corrupt society it was okay. it was a, it was a corrupt regime it fell but this was one nation the vietnamese people or the indochine as they used to be called it was a french colony to begin with and then there were different powers there it was one country was nation one nation throughout the history 
Yeah, but the but the war proved okay. So, for example, w- when America was divided between the South and the North, yes. and when the uh, c- civil war, right? This was a country in creation during the creation. This was a country of immigrants that started to this, to uh, the 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 war. Yeah, actually, yeah, the war between South and North was a, was a, was a civil war. It was a civil war. But, oh, yeah. uh, okay, but for of all... How, in- of how, how, how the shape of the big country should look like. But for all intents and purposes, you could have called them two separate nations because they they were radically different in their perceptions. But still one people. But that's but that's just an arbitrary well, definition. That's we, a forced we definition. Are, we are Korea. No, we are Korea. No, you are, you are part of us. No, you are part of us. That's a big difference. But those tribes, are just definitions. The tribes that identify only with themselves. How do you define a country? That's a good question. That's a good question. No, I'm asking you. Like, how do you define it's a country? It's a, a group, a large group of people who identify themselves with a flag, with common with common culture, probably with language, maybe with religion, with faith, with destiny, with flag, with national anthem, with many different things actually. So first of all, I th- so the way that I define a country, uh, aside from the obvious definitions which you would which you would find in a dictionary, which probably would be along the lines of uh, it's it's. Uh, a geographical territory that is defined as a country that has a ruling uh, entity, a government, right? And uh, they all abide by whatever the political uh, part, the, whatever the ruling uh, entity defines as laws. So they're defined by their laws as well. But if you have a situation in which the same geographical area that is still defined technically as a country that is now divided along enough along the lines of how to do things in a way that cannot be um, cannot be comprom- it's not it's so uncompromising as to become like a complete wedge between those things for me even if they didn't define themselves even they speak the same language they're the same people genetically they become two different countries. So the way that I see it is, you know this theory where it kind of deals with language development just like you deal with genetics? So the difference between two different languages and a different dialect is that a different dialect, it's still a variation of the same language in which the people that speak those two dialects can still kind of understand each other. The second the people can no longer understand each other, it makes it a different language, just like a different species is a species that can no longer mate. They can no longer make a baby together, right? Yeah. So there are species who are kind of like subdivisions and they can still mate with each other, but they can look even very differently, like dogs, for example. But if they can't mate, they're different species. If they can't talk, they're different species. If they can't agree about in a country as out to do a very particular thing that is a very big thing, then they're no longer the same country. That's just out to get... But the reason that it matters is because... In the end of the day, somebody is making decisions, and all the people in that country abide by those decisions. If they don't feel the obligation to listen to this government saying this thing, which North Korea doesn't feel any obligation to listen to what the, the government of South Korea is saying, they're a different country. And if they have to go to war to settle that, they're definitely a different country. So and is it, let me ask you a question, sure. Dr. Gordo, today. Sure. Is the United States a country? It is, a, but it's a republic. That's the is difference. The, is, no, it's the United States. It is plural. Yes. These are the 50, 50 or 51 states. Many states in one right? country. But the reason it's a republic, the difference here is that this is the only system in the world that is like that. It's a unique example. Of course it's a country. I believe it is. It is a country. Yeah. Well, a country, if I, if I think, in the, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, in the dictionary, country relates to the geography. And uh, a state relates to let me, the let political let me, thing. Let me yeah. go back to Russia. Was sure. the Soviet Union, not Russia. Yeah. Russia is also a problem with the, with the little breakaway uh, countries right, 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 right. like Dagestan, Chechnya and everything. Yeah. But is, is, was the Soviet Union a country? Um, with Lita, Latvia, Estonia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, I Azerbaijan. Think, I, you, I think you could at that point also Moldova. call it a republic. Yeah. Yeah. So why does that matter though? 
Because what's the definition of country? That's what you've been asking me. No, no, no. But the, I'm only going to the definition of country to understand your point. Because you're saying it's the same country because you keep saying it's the same language and genetically it's the same. But I'm saying that's not the t- determining factor. If I have to convince you by force to do something and you have enough force to resist me, we're not the same country. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that's how I view it. So it's like it, 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 we you can still define it as the same country, but it's not the same political entity that makes decision for everybody do, anymore. How does all part of the whole conversation start by the Korean example? Right. Korea, until 70 years ago, was one historical society, culture, nation, language, everything that you can possibly think but of. But it changed. For, dec- for centuries. But it changed. But, why yeah. did, but it's still, you know... It changed in a way that divided those this country into two political countries, but okay. not, but so not different. So not, sure, not I'll, different. I don't have a problem with they calling it. They still share the same history, the same culture, the same language, and both believe that they are in the in the in in the right side of history. Let's put it this way. Okay. The way East and West Germany used to be, the way North and South Vietnam used to be. Um, There must be other examples also in history. But uh, eventually, eventually, if you ask me, the, the South will prevail because the life, the quality of life in the North is so poor and so gloomy and so somber and so despicable. So at the end of the day, you know, and besides what, I mean, this is a crazy, you know, this is, These are crazy society. This is a crazy society where three rulers, father to son to grandson. But what kind of regime is it anyway? It's a family. It's like the Assad family. Yeah. And it, what, what kind of regime? And Assad will fall eventually too because this doesn't make sense. So that's my point to you that we had to take Saddam Hussein out. We took him, well, some of London is a different a, that example. That was a mistake, by the way, if you ask Whatever me. it was, but that was, okay. I, This was a mistake. Maybe, maybe. I'm not the, saying yes or no. I'm, I'm, I'm saying maybe. But I feel like the only way to deal with North Korea, what? The, the, the removal of Saddam Hussein. Created called, more chaos than. Caused a chaos that killed up to one million people I, in that region. I might even agree with inclu- you. Though. Including lots of Americans. Do you think the same thing would happen if we try to take out the the Kim Jong Un yeah yeah we I believe that even in any given moment like as we sit as we speak right now there are people sitting in Langley at the CIA headquarters yeah. in yeah. Virginia yeah thinking of what where is he what can we do what can be done I about him where he is where like who are his supporters who are the people in his surrounding circle Who are the people in charge of the nuclear system? How can we get control of them? And then how we can control of eliminating him? They try to convince him. They try. I don't believe, I don't, I don't see what's keeping him in power. I mean, he can't, like the lone ruler, we talked about Hitler, we talked N- about Putin. Nuclear warheads. Yeah, listen, yeah. yeah, but there must be people around him that accept this way, accept the system are ready to go on providing him the security and the confidence he needs to go on be Kim Jong-un the way the world Again, knows. it's all about circles of power. The people who are close enough to him have good enough life to keep him there, you know? Do But they? I, I would think so. Like, because they have, they have, the, they have the, what, what the tiers life, of society, what, right? What good life can you have? I mean, maybe we're not aware enough of what's going on in North Korea, in Pyongyang. I've never been there. You, never you should watch there. some documentaries about it. It's pretty, it's I pretty have. crazy. Yeah. I have. I have. You know, I have. You know how it started? I saw one day the, a, a story about the national airline, Koryo. Okay. It turned out that Koryo was the name of old Korea. That's where old Korea started. You know, Wait, what? You. Say it again? The national airline yeah. of North Korea. Crazy, nasty airline with airplanes that you don't want to fly. Yeah. But the name of the airline is Koyo. Okay. So I went to, you know, to Google and figured what Koryo means. Koryo means. Koryo is the name of old Korea, the old ancient society of Korea. Interesting. So maybe there must be out there. Maybe, maybe we, we're not sure. Maybe we don't know everything. Maybe we are being fed by Western propaganda, but 
But it seems like you everybody look at the quality will, yeah. of life out there. You look how scary everything looks out there. How people, you know, how people obey to everything he's saying. You look at him, you look at the people, you look at everyday people, you look at the quality of life, look at the streets of Prongue. You don't see cars, you don't see shops. Isn't that your answer? To how so society that's why, that's, yeah. why, that's why I hope that eventually he will be overthrown. Yeah. So let me, before we start kind of like rounding it off, I want to ask you some questions that are a little bit more out there. Is that okay? Go ahead. Okay. Ask me anything you want. Okay. I'm so not, I don't promise to answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'll, I'll I'm being a politician now. I will, I'm a terror. I will try and tie it to something a little bit more uh, uh, terrestrial so we can talk about it in real terms. So there was this story, in uh, I think a year ago, a year and a half ago, of this Israeli um, famous scientist who was also... Uh, something said I think so he was I forget what he was that I'm gonna put a thing because I'm gonna search it and find it but he was like he wasn't the head of the Mossad but he was something he was something very big like very important uh, I wish I remember exactly what it is but uh, somebody an individual with a lot of credibility in Israel okay a scientist a scientist who was also the head of Misrada uh, Bitachon the, the head of the um Let me find it, actually. Hold on. I'm going to tell you exactly who he is so you know I'm talking. What did he say? What, I, I what will is tell the, you exactly. Get, what the point is? Uh, his name is... Okay, I can't, I can't find, I'll find it after the show. But, but, but this, is, this is not fake news. This actually happened. I read the story. There was a whole interview with him. So the, 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 the setup of the story is that he was someone important with very high credibility. And he essentially was at the end of his career. And his statement was that... He has information about the actual existence of extraterrestrials, so aliens, and their connection to like certain you know trades with the American government and even that certain uh, bodies in Israel are involved. So now the question is, if this is something it sounds so crazy, You're right? talking about the um, the American gun No, no, he's Israeli. Not Jonathan and, Pollard. No, hold on. Let me Israeli. Find. Yeah. Yeah, Israel. No, he, in Israel, not in America. So he was saying, and he, he was saying pretty crazy stuff. He was saying that he has information that he can't officially disclose, that uh, there's actually a base. It's going to sound very crazy. I'm preparing you. There's actually, they have a base on Mars, and they do trade with the American government. There's like a whole like operation going on. So now... Who's trading with the American? Oh, and those aliens? Aliens, yeah. So the question is... Can, can you show me... Oh, the story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you show me the story? Can I hear... So we were talking a lot about media today, right? Right, right, right. Okay, right. so Who's, here... No, here, it's his words. He's my, can yeah. I hear him saying that? Let's see. Not just a quotation. So I you're saying hear, that it's possible that they just I, listen, wrote... And I, they wouldn't sue them? Listen. Yeah. I don't know who wrote it. Where did they write it? I never heard anything as such. Okay. I good. would I would believe that he said it, that he had said it when I hear him saying that. Okay. Okay. It's if I was your it. if I was your editor and we were in the newsroom right now yeah, and you would come good. up with this story, I would say, great, it's a great story. It's a breaking story. I'm ready to go. Break. You know, I'm 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 not gonna even wait for the for the time of the news. But you need to bring me his voice saying that. Okay. Um, there you go. This is the story. By Yediot Achronot, actually. Well. So, we're not talking about Yitzhak Ben Israel, so who, who is, is a professor, by Chaim Eshed. Chaim Eshed, okay. Well, you got me unprepared. <laughs> Good. Hey, hey, I'm sticking to my old, my old. Uh, no, I'm. I'm sticking to my journalistic rules. Please. That it took me five decades. Okay. To establish, Professor Chaim Esed, who was the head of the Israeli space program, leading the Israeli satellite program, saying the uh, UFOs are here, but they're not ready to publish it yet. Humanity is not ready. Mm -hmm. So crazy shit, right? Galactic Federation. I, listen, <laughs> listen, listen, listen. Yeah. 
Listen, I know the guy. So what? So what do I know? I am. I am not familiar with this person or with anything that he says here, but. I happen to know the guy who wrote this article, Ranan Shaked. Okay. I've known him for many years. He's not a friend of mine, but you know, he's, he's, a, he's a writer, he's a reporter that I've known for decades. He's a serious guy, but I would assume that if this had something to do with reality, it would have been published in a different way. In what look way? At, look at the picture. Can right. you, audience, can you see the yeah, picture? Yeah, yeah, here, let me show it to the And camera. plus, plus the headline. Try, why don't you right. just, go, just go ahead and translate the headline to your audience. The headline is, UFOs asked not to publish that they're here. The humanity is not ready for it yet. So, but, so, but this might be as a result of how journalism is down now, done nowadays. But that doesn't speak to the, to the fidelity of the information, right? Listen, there's a saying, there are so many sayings that I can possibly think of. <laughs> I was not prepared to that. <laughs> I'm glad that you are, not prepared. UFOs, but my, you know, the head of the, head <laughs> of the Israeli space agency saying that there are UFOs all over the place, not ready to identify themselves because humanity is not ready yet. You got me by surprise. I'm not ready for that. Go on. Why don't you just go ahead and tell me what do you think of that? Yeah. Well, no, no, no. So I'm so, going to be your devoted loyal listener. Yeah. So actually, to be honest with you, what I wanted to ask you about that, whether that you... connects to stuff that we've been talking about in the past. Like what? One of my previous visits here. Oh, yes. About stuff that you want Discovered. to share with you. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That you might want to share with me that we haven't done yet. Sure, we haven't done yet, yeah. but we, so I would assume gonna, we'll do soon. Well, we're going to yeah. do that. No, so it's, it's already out there, but... Maybe it has something to do with that. But maybe, well, no. Am, my, I, am I in the right path? No, the, but, well, we can talk about it. But my, my reason for asking that was to see... Uh, your opinion about dissemination of information. So when somebody like that, which clearly, again, has some reputation. Can you right? forward this to me? Of course. As yeah, we yeah. speak, so you're I not will... going to forget. No, this I won't is, forget. Yeah. This is, you know, because I might be going somewhere, you know, I'm I not lo- going to sleep tonight without, <laughs> without reading the whole article. <laughs> I would love to see what Danny. you think. <laughs> So, so my, 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 yeah. my real question was... Get to the point where you think you've seen everything and then you get that. <laughs> this is amazing. I've, I've stumbled... You know, Donald, Donald Trumpsfeld, who used to be the American uh, defense secretary uh, during 9-11, when they asked him, how could this happen to the American defense system? You know, an attack in that magnitude, you know, overthrowing everything that we believed in. He said, listen... You don't know what you don't know, but you don't know that you don't know what you don't know. Okay. The unknown, the known unknown and unknown the unknown. Known. unknown, unknowns, right. That's Donald Trump's fault, basically. But I didn't know that I didn't know that. <laughs> so, okay. So let me, let me c- c- connect it to something you can actually comment on. Mm-hmm. So if somebody, if you would have to, if you're interested, I will tell you what I think about that. But I do want to get your opinion on one thing before. Sure. Without knowing anything about the story, it might actually be better that you don't know anything about the story. Yeah. If let's say right now, either personally or through a, a, a news outlet that you work for, you would be tasked right now to look into this. What would be your first course of action? What, what would, would you try and find the guy who said this or the reporter who wrote this? To get the some report, initial the reporter, the reporter, because you know him, right? What yeah. would you ask him? Because he is the only reliable thing that I, the only thing can rely on is knowing the person who wrote this. So since I don't know the person who supposedly said whatever is being quoted here, I would probably, and I've done this before, you know, I would create all this crazy information sitting in the newsroom, you know, as a news editor or producer. And getting all these pieces of information, and not calling the source or you know the guy, the guy who behind the news, but the guy who brought me the news. How sure are you? How positive? How confident are you that this is true? Or maybe you know. And why? Because I want. No, no, no. And 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 you would ask him, and why are you so sure? Basically, of course. Yeah. Mm. Of course, you know. So, so that would be the so, first two questions. How so, do you know that this is? So let, let's go to something more simple than that. 
let's see let's say that I'm sitting in the newsroom I'm a news editor and my political analyst or reporter or a commentator comes up with a big breaking political story I wouldn't go on air with that until I figure exactly what's behind the story who are your sources where did you get it of course we're not gonna disclose I'm not gonna be able to say on air who you know because you are you need you promised full confidentiality to whoever brought you the story. But me, as an editor, I need to take responsibility. Because if this is fake and somebody might sue me, and this is the credibility not only of me or the reporter, it's the whole network, it's the channel. And it's basically the ethics and the credibility of the profession that we are trying to, to be part of. So let's say you go down that rabbit hole and you speak to the reporter and, he, and you are convinced now that the guy actually said that, right? What would be the motive of somebody, of someone like that, to say something like this if it's not true? There are so many cases like that. There's so like so he, he wants levels. to come back to the important... People who say so many different things. No, but that's crazy. That, and, that, that's and some... are ready to swear in the life of themselves and of whoever they relate to. But that doesn't explain why they said it, right? I cannot be responsible okay. for that. I see. You know, okay. Many people have so many reasons to say so many things or do different things. Yeah. Why do people, you know, why do people do different things? You know, yeah. sometimes in harm's way, you know. This, in the, you yeah. know, having lived now in the U.S., I'm going to divert the conversation to something that connects somehow to what you say. Why people do, why people say something, stuff like that. The things that bother me the most, that really breaks my heart, and I love America. I lived in the United States. Otherwise, I wouldn't have lived here now for the second time around for three years now. Plus the three years I used to live in the early 90s. How come these mass shootings here in the States, especially this part where kids in the teens or maybe in the early 20s get those guns, go to school and start shooting around and killing everybody, little kids in the classrooms? So what is the question? Why, why people are doing that? Oh, come on. I mean, this is like a, such a... Why people are difficult... saying nasty things? Why people are so full of... Sh saying nasty things? What do yes. you mean? People are doing and saying different things that can only hurt, humiliate, or embarrass. Why people do that? Where? Where? In social All media? Over, everywhere. Everywhere. I mean... This is mainstream media. This is idiot or not. Yeah. Yeah. So... So why people are, you, you, you're asking me why did he But you say, see what's interesting about the situation right now is that it never, it, it I doesn't... Took to the, I took, maybe I didn't make myself clear enough. Sure, I sure. Took to, I took you to the extreme. Which is? The young kids going with, 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 uh, with assault weapons into school and shooting everybody. No, I just don't see the connection at all. Because people are doing strange and scary things. And that's an extension of people saying scary but, things. Well, wait a second. This wait is a scary. Second. This is not even funny. Okay, hold on. So what's interesting to me about the situation right now is that you made the connection between a crazy act like shooting kids in school and what he said yes. here in the story. Yes. Okay. It yes. means two things to me. Yeah. The first one is that at no point in your reasoning, you assume that what he's saying might actually be true. That's exactly. the first thing. The second thing is that you making a, a distinction that to me is a little strange uh, you're making a connection that to me is a little strange yes. between an, an, a behavior that is horrible, like sh you know school shootings, but nevertheless the behavior is understandable. Not understandable in the sense of like, well, like, I understand how they could do it, but in the sense that you, it's not out of the realm of explanation as to why they, if they're it's troubled. Be, it's beyond my comprehension. Wait, if, After, if somebody is you know, really troubled and yes. in so much pain yes. and they just show up and they just want to destroy something else... I mean, I I never reached such a situation, but I can understand a situation like that. No, I can't. You can't. No. Okay. No. It's it's also seen why a person in this guy's position mm -hmm. would come up and say something like that. But what's in? But I'm connecting it to something much larger that I seem I, I see that you have some closed doors to, but I I have to try and knock because it's important. I think there's uh, for for example there's uh, Eric Weinstein who is a public intellectual, and he's not known for somebody who is, you know, interested in weird subjects for no reason. And in the last three years, 
he all of a sudden discovered some information, both behind closed doors and also openly, yeah. that made him rethink this whole subject. Spe- like what subject? The alien subject. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because there was a lot, aside from all, a lot of accounts of actual pilots, like fighter pilots, that this yeah. is recorded by multiple uh, sources at the same time, in real time, right? Yeah. Uh, and some individuals who, you know, say certain things that they can't necessarily tell you how they know this. But again, those are individuals that have something to lose in their reputation. And also some information that he said that he was approached personally that he can't really disclose. But again, considering who the individual is, no, hold on. Because he is not somebody who's interested in this kind of a publicity. This is not something of part of his repertoire. It's not, it never was. So the individual really matters. Uh, he started having this public conversation that is very interesting. You might find it interesting. He started engaging with this question from the most scientific point of view, because he is a scientist. And he asked himself the question, he was like, hold on, something is going on here. I don't know what it is, but something is happening here. So it's very possible that what in fact is going on is that it's a very big, giant disinformation campaign that somebody conjured the American government for whatever reason, maybe they have developed some kind of weapon system that they don't want anybody to know. So now they're putting all the cards into like, oh, you know, it's aliens. Like, so that might be that. But there's no question that something is going on. Also, I don't know if you know, but the Pentagon released documents, official documents that state that they have recovered materials that are not of this world, that is stated black on white from the Pentagon. Now, it can be part of a disinformation thing, and there might be like a very advanced weapon system here. But, and by the way, what you just saw, this story might be a I part of that. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen yet, and you know what? You haven't seen what? The story. I saw the headline just. No, no, I read the story. So, like, so, so I, the, yeah. You should have given, you know, if we were about to hunt, to conduct this conversation, you should have forwarded this. Con- oh, I was. I didn't even know earlier, that this is what we we're going to talk about. It just earlier, came to me. Yeah. And then let me think. Maybe read a little bit more. Do my research. Yeah. Now, I, what I've done yet now is something that I don't really like. Which is? I've been commenting on something that I'm not familiar yeah. with. Yeah. But I, I'm. I but I'm not thinking. It. I just saw it headline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm not holding you. Sensational. Your sure, sure, sure. Yeah. And it. It drove me into conclusion in an area that had not necessarily something. Sure, sure, sure. Just, I'm not holding your feet to, to the fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not trying to push you to the corner. Yeah. I'm, I'm simply saying one thing that I think you can comment about, which is that the it actually ties to my first question to you in this conversation, which is that the way that journalism is done now seems to be playing into the hands of like you said, it needs to be completely separate, right? Yes. It seems to no longer be the case because if, if let's say that this is a disinformation campaign, yes. then whoever put out the story didn't do the due diligence to actually check. He saw like an opportunity of somebody with a reputation who's saying something very crazy and he knew, he knew that this is going to be a big story because it's in the Idiot Achronot, which is a, a very known Israeli uh, newspaper. It's kind of like the New, the New York Times, would you say? Yeah, probably. Yeah. And, uh, and because of that, it seems like even him that you're saying is a reputable individual. Yeah, but I wouldn't take it as an example. It, it, this story represents nothing. Okay. It's a big exception. You don't get to see that in the mainstream media, like in the Otachonot or any other mm. you know, major you know, he, you know, mainstream media uh, publication. Okay. I, you, don't, you don't get to see that. Actually, I haven't seen that yet. And, uh, this is pretty old it, at this point. It's it, like a year yes, or something. Yeah, okay. Still, it doesn't represent anything. Okay. It's so an you're exception. Saying- it's an exception. It represents nothing. I wouldn't jump to conclusion as of the faith and the destiny and what is the media up to right now. Mm. Okay. Okay, I'll take that. So again, is uh, in closing words because I know that you gotta go soon. Um, yeah, but, but listen. We can always meet again. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I'm, do I'm down. And, and actually, I would love to hear your commentary after. Maybe we you, can, ta- we you can even. Do that. I would love to see what if you even talk to the guy and ask him what that was all about. I would love to know. Um, I could do that. Th- that would be very interesting. I could actually. do that. Yeah. yeah. If you if you if you would have to imagine a scenario in which the world does go to a better place, what would that be? As far as like the thing with Ukraine, can you, you envision? Know, that's that's, the, that's. Let me tell you a secret. Sure. This is something. 
when I put my head on the pillow every night, this is exactly the question I'm asking myself, believe it or not. Really? My partner, whom you know, knows it. Yeah. Now you do. Okay. So this is it's something... A, it's something... It's not a big secret, you know. It's just something I'm like, what? You know, after... you, Because usually it's after, like, watching the news or talking to people after a long day. Like, what can happen? What should be? What can make this world better? And... Um, and I still haven't found the answer. <laughs> okay, that's a that's a fair answer. Um, so again, I know you got to run. Uh, I thank you for taking so much time of your day to actually come and talk to yeah, me. Yeah, it's so it? flattering. Somebody was willing to sit around and talk to me or with me or to me for two and a half hours. This is a, this is this is very interesting. It's very flattering. I I appreciate that. It's very thank flattering you. to me that you, you took the time. So thank, thank you for that. And I, I we'll talk again when you know more about aliens and we can talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> more oh, well. <laughs> well, there you go. Thank we you, can buddy. we can we can widen the subject. We we could talk about personal personal subjects also sometime. You know? I I that's what I wanted. Hope I was hoping to get to. I wanted to let's talk do about it, let's yeah. do it next time. Yeah, let's, let's have another appointment. Toda raba. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Dankeschön. Marhaba. Shukran. Spasiva. Yeah.